Hello and welcome back to this series of videos uh, for my HUP 112 Logic and Philosophy class. My name is Dr. Richard Brown and today we'll be continuing um, our introductory exploratory beginning basic concepts phase and um, in the last video I gave a kind of overview of uh, the basic concepts of validity and propositions and the, and the things that we're working with. Now I want to work through some examples. So these um, all come from our textbook, which is, as I've mentioned, is um, Hurley at this point. Um, uh, the text is um, Logic's the Essential, which is a kind of shorter version of the, uh, the classic text, uh, um, uh, Logic, a Concise Introduction. So these examples come from the textbook, and I um, typically make sure to only go over the examples in the videos that uh, have the answers in the book. That way, you know, for in class and for other things, um, I won't be giving away anyone's uh, <laughs> quizzes or anything like that. So um, this one up at the top left corner, you can see I just put the the section. These are from exercise 1.1 of the textbook, and this is number one right here. And um, what's nice about these various editions of the textbook is that they collect these um, passages from various places. So you can see that this one is actually from a chemistry book. Um, a molecular approach second edition. So let's just read what it says right there. It says carbon monoxide molecules happen to be just the right size and shape and happen to have just the right chemical properties to fit neatly into cavities with hemoglobin molecules in blood that are normally reserved for oxygen molecules. Consequently carbon monoxide diminishes the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. So that's an argument we can tell uh, if, if it wasn't clear from the implicit relations there that the word consequently is indicating that the conclusion is carbon monoxide diminishes the oxygen carrying capacity of blood and we can see that that would leave the other sentence as our premise. <clears throat> now that sentence is a very long sentence and uh, maybe it's even composed of uh, more than one proposition so there's the claim that carbon monoxide molecules happen to be just the right size and shape um, to fit neatly into cavities with hemoglobin molecules in blood that are normally reserved for oxygen molecules. There seems also to be the claim that carbon, mono uh, carbon monoxide molecules um, happen to have just the right chemical properties to fit neatly into cavities with hemoglobin molecules in blood that are normally reserved for oxygen molecules and maybe ultimately those would come apart as two distinct claims with two distinct um, uh, truth conditions associated with them. But the person who has written this, um, uh, Nivaldo <laughs> J. Tro, I guess, um, I'm not sure who, who that is, but in all seriousness, whoever was saying this um, said that it as one full sentence. And so representing an argument in standard form, we want to show which sent what propositions uh, are the premises and which proposition are the conclusion and we want to make sure that in doing that we stick as close as possible to preserving the structure of whatever is presented with us. Of course if it's your own thoughts you, you can structure them as you're thinking but uh, if you're trying to capture what someone else has written then it's, it's often best to, to represent it though, as, at least um, um, as much as possible with what's already given there. Okay so then we would also put a, a, a marker noting that the conclusion is carbon monoxide diminishes the oxygen comparing capacity of, of blood. Now it, it's, it's pretty much standard to use P to indicate the premise and if there's more than one you number it premise one, premise two and then you C uh, to indicate which thing is the conclusion. It, it doesn't really matter uh, which way you do it. What you need is some kind of way to represent what the structure of the argument is since what there is is there's a claim on the one hand that something is true, um, though that's the factual claim, and those embody the premises or claiming that someone has said that these things are true, and then also there is the claim that these things support or imply um, some other thing, and that is the conclusion. So we're just trying to take something which may be written in English um, and try to represent it in a more formal way, uh, trying to capture some of the structure. Uh, more explicitly the relationship which is being um, uh, claimed. Of course if the argument is valid that relationship will uh, hold 
And if it's invalid, it won't. And if it's an inductive argument, uh, we have different kinds of evaluatory practices. Um, okay, so let's do some more examples. This one's number four from the book. Um, again, this is taken from uh, a judge uh, in a case, United States v. Jones. I don't know the context of this, to be honest, but let's just read what it says. <clears throat> it says, when individuals voluntarily abandon property, they forfeit any expectation of privacy in it they might have had. Therefore, a warrantless search or seizure of abandoned property is not unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so it seems from reading this kind of clear what the maybe the issue in the case may have been. Um, but there clearly is an argument here. We see the word therefore. And uh, there's only those two sentences. So the first sentence, when individuals voluntarily abandon property, they forfeit any expectation of privacy in it they may have had. That's a premise. And the conclusion is the other sentence there. <clears throat> a warrantless search or seizure of abandoned property is not unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so... Um, again, just one premise and one conclusion. Arguments in um, classical logic can have any number of premises, uh, but they'll always have just one conclusion. Um, so there will always be one sentence which is being supported or claimed to be being supported by the other propositions. Um, okay, again, another example. This one, number seven uh, from exercise 1.1. This one from the U.S. National Institutes of Health, your guide to healthy sleep. Interesting. Uh, let's read. It really does matter if you get enough sleep. We need sleep to think clearly, react quickly, and create memories. Studies show that people who are taught mentally challenging tasks do better after a good night's sleep. Other research suggests that sleep is needed for creative problem solving. Okay, so this is an argument. Uh, the first thing you want to do uh, to, uh, to put the argument into standard form is to identify the conclusion. And we look around and we don't see any uh, obvious conclusion indicators. Um, <clears throat> no words like since or therefore or because. Uh, but we do see a kind of standard pattern embodied in this example. And that's that the first sentence, it really does matter if you get enough sleep, is the, uh, introducing the conclusion and then the rest of the sentences that follow are um, uh, enunciating the reasons why you should accept that conclusion. So the conclusion is the first sentence. This is a kind of standard thing that people do, especially in English. You find this all the time where someone says uh, that P or here's a proposition, that P. And then they go on to say, and this is why you should believe that P. So there's obviously um, more than one premise here. And in fact, um, we want to give a number to each one of these premises. So we'll just take the sentences in the order that they come. So the first premise is we need, to, we need sleep to think clearly, react quickly, and create memories. So that's the first sentence. The second premise, uh, we'll just follow again the second sentence. Studies show that people who are taught mentally challenging tasks do better after a good night's sleep. Um, <clears throat> and then we need one more. Other research suggests that sleep is needed for creative problem solving. And then we represent the conclusion. It really does matter if you get enough sleep. So notice that we haven't really manipulated these sentences um, at this point. The goal is not to, uh, to rearrange or to change or to try to clean them up or anything like that. We're just trying to take what's there written in the English and to put it into a form which is more easily recognizable um, uh, uh, as showing us the parts of arguments. And that's what we're really interested in. So if we really look at this, we see, aha, um, we see what the three premises are and which thing is a conclusion. And then, of course, we can ask questions. Is it a good argument? Is it a bad argument? But the very first thing you want to do um, when you get your whole hands on some English and you think there's an argument there is you want to represent it in standard form. And to do that, you identify the premises and conclusion. Now, do you need to write P1, P2, P3, and C? Whatever. Um, those are kind of really basically standard ways of representing um, the premise and conclusion. You can just number the things. That's what I often do. Just write one, two, three, and then mark the conclusion with a C or so oftentimes um, uh, in some other kind of conventional way. So I'll show you in this example, um, which comes from a psychology textbook.
So let's go ahead and take a look at what it says. It says punishment, when speedy and specific, may suppress undesirable behavior, but it cannot teach or encourage desirable alternatives. Therefore, it is crucial to use positive techniques to model and reinforce, uh, reinforce appropriate behavior that the person can use in place of the unacceptable response that has to be suppressed. Okay, so that's an interesting argument. And in fact, that is something you find um, that, that psych introductory psychology textbooks are often talking about. But there's something that's interesting about this. So I was just a, a minute ago saying that it's often best to stick with the way that the English is presented, but sometimes you need to rearrange things slightly in order to make clear what's really going on. Because, for instance, we see in this case, the word therefore is there, and it indicates the conclusion. And the conclusion is that whole long sentence, it is crucial to use positive techniques to model and reinforce appropriate behavior that the person can use in place of the unacceptable response that has to be suppressed. So that is the conclusion. But how many premises are there here? Well, we see punishment when speedy and specific may suppress undesirable behavior. That's one premise. And then we see, but it cannot teach or encourage desirable alternatives. Um, well, what is that really saying? Well, what it really is saying is that punishment cannot teach or encourage desirable alternatives. So while you could just have that as one sentence, keep that whole thing as one premise, it probably makes sense in this case to say, Punishment, when speedy and specific, may suppress undesirable behavior as one premise. And then as another premise, punishment cannot teach or encourage desirable alternatives. And then to represent, aha, well, here is the conclusion. It is crucial to use positive techniques to model and reinforce appropriate behavior that the person can use in place of unacceptable response that has to be suppressed. So uh, it wouldn't be technically wrong to just write it the way that it was with the word but right there and everything like that. Um, but because of the word it uh, is referring back to punishment, you may think, well, let's just make that a separate sentence. And really, these two ways of doing it, whether you keep it the first way where it's just this um, uh, strictly sticking to what it, the English tells you right there, or whether you re rearrange things, it often won't make a difference. In this case, it would not make any difference. These two are, are kind of logically equivalent. This, I think, makes clearer what the person is doing when they reason in this way. The other way would be perfectly fine as well. Now, one other thing to notice here is that um, I left off the P, P1, P2, and C right there. So I just put one, two, and there's a dash line. It, that really should be a kind of line like you know, like you find in an addition problem, a solid line there. Um, and then what's underneath that line is the conclusion. So that's another way of representing standard form um, where you don't write P1, P2, and then C, but you just write the numbers in front of the propositions, which are the, the premises, and then a kind of solid line um, indicating that the thing underneath is the conclusion, and that's like going, saying, therefore. Okay, so there are multiple ways to do it. I'll probably stick to the way that the book does it just so that there's no confusion. But this is another standard way of doing it. Okay, so let's take another example. Um, here it says, since private property helps people define themselves, since it frees people from mundane cares of daily subsistence, and since it is finite, no individual should accumulate so much property that others are prevented from accumulating the necessities of life. Okay, so that's a good argument there. Very interesting. Um, and this one's very clear what the structure of it is. The word since here is indicating the premises, and since is before each of the premises. And the conclusion is the one um, that doesn't have a since in front of it. So we would represent this in standard form. Premise one, private property helps people define themselves. Notice the word since is not there in our um, uh, standard form representation of the argument, because what we're doing is since is part of English, and in English it's telling you that the thing which follows it is a, um, a premise and an argument in this case, and we, we're no longer writing this thing in English. We're taking, I mean, obviously it's in English, but we're, we're, this isn't like a paragraph of English. We're writing an argument in standard form, numbering the premises, and so instead of the word since, we just have the P1 colon right there, which tells us this thing is the premise over here. Um, and then premise two, again, the thing which follows from um, the sense, notice we have to fill in the it. You can't just write it frees people from mundane cares of daily subsistence. 
because that's um, without knowing what the it refers to, you can't tell whether that sentence is true or false. So to be a full proposition, you need to write private property. Frees people from mundane cares of daily subsistence. So you need to put that in the um, full proposition. And then, of course, we have another premise here um, given to us by the sense again. Since it is finite, uh, therefore, the conclusion in this case is no individual should accumulate so much property that others are prevented from accumulating the necessities of life. life. So I think that one was uh, fairly straightforward because of all the senses there, but um, may have been somewhat slightly confusing because there's nothing that indicates what the conclusion is except the absence of um, the premise indicators. Okay, so let's do another one here. This one is again for chemistry, for changing times. So radioact radioactive fallout isn't the only concern in the aftermath of nuclear explosions. Uh, the nations of planet Earth have acquired nuclear weapons with an explosive power equal to more than a million Hiroshima bombs. Studies suggest that explosion of only half these weapons would produce enough soot, smoke, and dust to blanket the Earth, block out the sun, and bring on a nuclear winter that would threaten the survival of the human race. Ye ouch. Okay, so that's um, a scary argument, uh, but nonetheless uh, um, one that we can analyze. So it seems, again, this is one of those ones that follows the pattern uh, that we mentioned before, where the conclusion seems to be given to us in the very first sentence. Radioactive fallout isn't the only concern in the aftermath of nuclear explosions. Is um, uh, the conclusion that all of these other sentences seem to be supporting. So uh, listing out the premises, the nations of planet Earth have acquired nuclear weapons with an explosive uh, power equal to more than a million Hiroshima bombs. Studies suggest that explosions of only half of these weapons would produce enough soot, smoke, and dust to blanket the earth, block out the sun, and bring on a nuclear winter that would threaten the survival of the human race. Notice there's no way to really break that down um, in a way that wouldn't be redundant. So if you wanted to have to do what we did before, you say studies suggest that explosion of only half of these weapons would produce enough soot to blanket the earth, uh, would produce enough dust to blanket the earth to block out the sun. See, so that really is a kind of sentence you want to keep packaged in the way that it is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the English. And then there's the conclusion, radioactive fallout isn't the only concern in the aftermath of nuclear explosions. So again, this is uh, putting the argument into standard form. Um, let's do another example here. Uh, one that's perhaps more interesting. Oh, social problems. Okay. Poverty offers, offers numerous benefits to the non-poor. Okay. Anti-poverty programs provide jobs for middle-class professionals in social work, penology, and public health. Such workers' future advancement is tied to continued growth of bureaucracies dependent on the existence of poverty. Okay, so that's an interesting argument, maybe a bit of a callous one, some might say, but nonetheless one that we can, um, uh, we can analyze. It seems the conclusion here, again, is given by the first sentence. Poverty offers numerous benefits to the non-poor. And so the rest of the sentences seem to be trying to support the claim that people who aren't poor are actually benefited uh, by there being persons who are poor. So the first premise is anti-poverty programs provide jobs for middle-class professionals and social work, um, uh, criminal justice, and so forth, and public health. Um, and the second premise here is that the people who work in these people, uh, in these fields, um, their advancement is tied to the continued growth of bureaucracies dependent on the existence of poverty. And then, as we saw earlier, the conclusion is that therefore poverty offers numerous benefits to the non-poor. Now remember, you, you may not agree with the conclusion of this argument, um, but if you didn't agree, then you would want to check to see whether the argument was valid and whether you thought, thought these two premises were true. So that's exactly what we're here to do in this class. Um, at this point, we're just building up to our ability to be able to do that by first getting clear on our ability to analyze arguments in the standard form. Because as we saw in the previous video, once we have the argument in the standard form, 
then we want to know whether the argument's valid. Is it an inductive argument? Is it deductive? Is it valid? Is it sound? Is it strong? Is it cogent? Um, and so the, to use all the tools that logic is going to bring to bear, we first have to be able to extract the argument out of its um, original hiding place, either in the thinking of a person or in the text of something that we're analyzing. So we're not here to do any of those um, uh, analyses yet. We're building up to that, even though I know you maybe want to just dive right in and start analyzing some of these arguments. Okay, so let's take another one um, on whistleblowing. <clears throat> the stakes in whistleblowing are high. Take the nurse who alleges that physicians enrich themselves in her hospital through unnecessary surgery. The engineer who discloses safety deficits, uh, defects, excuse me, in the braking systems of a fleet of new rapid transit vehicles. The defense department official who alerts Congress to military graft and overspending. All know they pose a threat to those whom they denounce and that their own careers may be at risk. Okay. So um, this seems to be uh, an argument, and again, the conclusion seems to be stated in the very first sentence. The stakes of whistleblowing are high, and the conclusion, I mean, excuse me, the evidence for this seems to be that whole one long sentence right there. So there's, uh, take the nurse who alleges that physicians enrich themselves in her hospital through unnecessary surgery. There's a semicolon there. Um, so is that next thing that follows an, another sentence or not? No, it's somehow connected to the first thing. The engineer who discloses, discloses safety deficits, another semicolon. The defense department official who alerts Congress. Military graft, no spending, colon. All know they pose a threat to those whom they denounce. So this is one where you could uh, just represent it in this way. Um, the sentence sort of says it in a way that makes it easy to digest, if you really wanted to, you could try to re rearrange what the person was saying um, by saying that um, everyone who blows the whistle poses a threat to whom the, those that they denounce, and therefore their careers are at risk, and therefore the stakes of whistleblowing are high. So uh, she's obviously giving you some examples here. I'm assuming Cecilia Bach is a woman, actually. I don't really know if I should be assuming that. Um, but uh, the, the author is giving you um, a kind of enunciation of examples to get to this basic point. Everybody who blows the whistle poses a threat to whom they blow the whistle on and therefore are in danger of losing their job um, and therefore uh, uh, the stakes are high. So this is again one of those kind of choices uh, uh, where you could choose to so, sort of finesse what the English or just leave it there. Um, it's fine in the, at this early stage to just leave it that way because nothing really hangs on it. It's not going to be easier to do anything afterwards. Okay, so let's take another example. Contrary to the tales of some scuba divers, the toothy, gappy grin, gaping grin on the mouth of an approaching shark is not necessarily anticipatory. It is generally accepted that by constantly swimming with its mouth open, the shark is simply avoiding suffocation. This assures a continuous flow of oxygen-laden water in their mouths, over their gills, and out through the gill slits. And that's from Biology, the Science of Life. <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, <laughs> this seems like an interesting argument. Apparently, I did not know this, apparently um, some scuba divers are telling tales <laughs> that <laughs> sharks grin as they approach you because they're anticipating eating you. <laughs> so I don't know why I find that funny, but I guess that would be pretty scary to see the shark swimming towards you with its mouth open like that. But um, yes, the facts of biology certainly do seem to suggest that that isn't the case. So uh, the premise one would be that it is generally accepted that by constantly swimming with its mouth open, the shark is simply avoiding suffocation. So that's the first sentence after that, which is the conclusion. Um, and the second premise, <clears throat> this assures a continuous flow of oxygen laden water into the shark's mouth over its gills and out through the gill slit. So here, um, it, it, there's a bit of a question whether you'd want to just leave it as this assures a continuous flow or whether you would want to say that um, a sh the swimming with its mouth open assures a continuous flow. 
uh, to make sure that that is a full proposition right there. Of course, um, just leaving it as the English there, um, you would get this. And uh, in this case, I think it would be okay to, to write it that way, which is why I wrote it that way, even though I think it would be more technically correct <laughs> to um, change it. And maybe I should have done that, but I didn't. Um, I still think this is okay. But anyway, the conclusion is obviously contrary to the tales of some scuba divers, the toothy gaping grin on the mouth of an approaching shark is not necessarily anticipatory. Um, okay, so um, now remember, it's not when you're reading something that someone else has written, uh, it's not always 100% obvious what the best way to represent the argument in standard form is. So these examples are given to us because it's fairly clear what the standard form would be of the arguments that are being presented. But even so, it can, it can be somewhat tricky. So it's best to just do as many examples as you can um, and uh, to always be on the lookout for these sorts of things. Okay, so here's another example. Anyone familiar with our prison system knows there are some inmates who behave little better than brute beasts. But the very fact that these prisoners exist is a telling argument against the efficacy of capital punishment as a deterrent. If the death penalty had been truly effective as a deterrent, such prisoners would long ago vanished. Uh, would have, would long ago have vanished. Sorry about that. Okay, so that's from the injustice of the death penalty. Um, clearly, someone's trying to make an argument here against the death penalty. Um, and so uh, we can analyze the structure of it. Now, this one looks, again, to be one where there is no clear indicator of what the premise and conclusion is. So we read, anyone familiar with our prison system knows that there are inmates who behave little better than brute beasts. But the very fact that these prisoners exist is a telling argument against the efficacy of capital punishment as a deterrent. So we say, aha, a telling, a telling argument against the efficacy of capital punishment as a deterrent. So it seems like that's supposed to be what the conclusion of this argument is. They say, okay, so there are these people and that the fact that they exist suggest that this other thing um, doesn't really work. So we can just go ahead and say, aha, there's a conclusion. The rest of these things are premises. So anyone familiar with our prison system knows that there are some inmates who behave little better than brute beasts is a premise. If the death penalty had been truly effective as a deterrent, such prisoners would have long ago vanished. The very fact that these prisoners exist is a telling argument against the efficacy of um, capital punishment of as a deterrent. So we have the, um, the conclusion right there. Now, of course, the very fact that these prisoners are, exist is a telling argument. Don't we might want to say we want to rearrange that in some way um, and just say that uh, um, cap capital punishment is not a deterrent or something like that is the conclusion of, of this argument. But it isn't really clear that that is the argument um, because the person is not arguing, the author is not arguing that the, the, uh, that it's false that the um, capital punishment is a effective deterrent. What they seem to be arguing is that there's a telling argument against the claim. So they're saying, look, there is, the existence of these things seem to suggest that there's an argument against the efficacy of capital punishment. So uh, you may disagree and think there's a stronger conclusion that can be drawn from what this person has said, but this is what they have actually suggested is the conclusion of their argument, that the very fact that these prisoners exist is a telling argument against the efficacy uh, of capital punishment as a deterrent. So once again, uh, how you represent an argument in standard form can be a bit of an art, especially when you have something which can be taken in multiple ways. And, and as always, as we go through this, hopefully it starts to become clear to yourself um, as you're right in your own writing, uh, what kind of signals you're sending to the people who are reading it and whether or not they're, um, if they were trying to reconstruct the argument which was present in your text, if someone were looking at a paragraph from something you had written and were saying, what are the premises and what are the conclusions here, how would they represent it? Would it be difficult for them? Would they be able to figure it out or not? So these are the sorts of things that we're here to train ourselves to be sensitive to and hopefully um, um, come to improve.